many people rode your motorcycle to sunrise service this morning? No. Bill. No. That was a bad, that was a bad instructor for you, huh? <laughs> Teaching Bill how to fib over there. You used to call me Pastor Fibber. My wife uh, shared uh, last week with some people that uh, I said, you know, I used to tell people that I'm Irish, I tell tales. Because I'm used to know you lie. So my, my nickname became Pastor Fibber because I was a teller of tales. So, uh, so Bill, I guess, followed a, a good lead there. So. <laughs> So we did have a good morning this morning. We were very excited about our sunrise service, and and uh, uh, let me kind of give you an illustration of, of what I want to talk about today. If you want to start turning there, it's First Corinthians, pardon me, First Corinthians chapter 15. But as you know, and again, you know, we're going to be obviously talking about the resurrection because again. Bottom line is that's what our faith is built on. That's the foundation of who we are. If Jesus did not die on the cross, if he wasn't buried, if he did not rise on the third day, what do we hang on? What do we hinge on? We don't. Our faith is empty. And as we read the scripture, you'll find that out. But Paul, when he uh, uh, sent these letters to various churches, sent them for instructional purposes to guide and lead them through doing church correctly. Amen? What we try to do is we try to have a church according to the Word of God, not according to the Word of man or to the will of man. If we had a church more according to the will of God, guess what? We'd be Holy Spirit filled all the time. We'd be jumping and bouncing all over the place. You wouldn't have to have your pastor up here jumping around being excited all by himself because you would have the Holy Ghost in you. Amen? Okay? If you're saved, you receive that Holy Spirit. What you need to do is say, Spirit, rise up in me, take those grave clothes off, and set me free. Amen? That's what's the exciting thing about it. That's why I like when he talked about Lazarus. What do you say about Lazarus? Come on out here and stand, show everybody how you look after you're dead. No. He told the grave he said, loose him and set him free. Amen? So if we do it God's way, guess what? You can have church. See, that's what's having church. When you get excited in the Lord, when you know what the Lord's done for you is real, okay, by faith, you get excited. You know, I can't believe I'm the only one that gets excited. Some of you guys are like half my age. And your excitement is already gone. Wait till you get 60 years old and you start aching and hurting and your back goes out all the time and you start walking like this and, and, and you start feeling bad and you start listening to everybody else say, well, you know, that's what happens when you get old. I ain't going to get old. I kind of want to be like Moses. You know, I kind of want to be like Caleb in the Old Testament. And these guys are 80 years old. And what did Caleb say? He said, man, I feel today, he was 80 years old, okay? Now, his relationship with God was such that he said, I feel today like I did when I crossed over here. And I'm thinking, this dude's 80 years old, and he's just as stoked now as he was 40-some years earlier. Amen? Man, when you get saved, okay, you get excited. Your faith is built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You get excited. I can't help but be excited. been saved for a while. Not long enough, but I still get excited what Christ does for me. This day for me is just the epitome of my faith. It's the foundation of everything I live for as a Christian. Why? Because there are people out there that don't believe. Why? Because they don't see it in our lives. They need to see the excitement. You're a Christian? Yeah! Let me tell you why. Let me tell you that a man loved me so much, he gave himself for me. Not, and it's not as simple as he just went to the cross. Sometimes we just blow that off. Like, well, he went to the cross. And he took him down, put him in a, a, in a brand new tomb, and on the third day he rose. It's what he went through before he even got to the cross for us. All the time having us in his sights. I've never experienced that kind of love in my life. So when I read that and, and I experience today, I'm like, man, we should be overwhelmed with the love of God today. If you're a believer in Christ, you have faith and belief in what he did today, you should be overwhelmed by his love. And being overwhelmed by his love, you would want nothing more than someone else to share that with. Amen? That's how the body of Christ grows. We get caught up with issues. We get caught up with situations. All we need to do is get caught up with Jesus. And show the lost and dying world that we're real, genuine, and that we believe what we believe. And why? 
and watch the people be attracted to you. Everybody wants to do things on their own because they're searching for something. Fill that void. Let them see Jesus in your life. Don't let them see you. Let them see Jesus in your life. That's what it's about. That's what today is about. It's about Christ. It should always be about Christ in the body of Christ. We are a part of his church, his bride, that he came to redeem with his own blood. And not only did he come to redeem with his own blood, but to rise again. What? To defeat death and the grave. What? For us. I like what he said to Mary back when her brother died last week, buried in the tomb. And, and Mary said, Jesus, you know what? If you'd have been here. Don't we get like that sometimes? You know, when things are kind of going tough, things are going south real quick. Lord, if you'd just been here. And all the time, if we just stop and listen to that still small voice, he says, I am here. I am here. We don't always hear him in the thunder and the roar and the earthquakes. He's here. But he said, where did he tell her? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. He said, Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die yet, shall he live. And anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. That's exciting stuff. See, we should live for that. Paul wrote what? To die was what? Gain. Not lost. When you know Jesus, you don't worry about some of those things. That's the resurrection story. But Paul wrote to the first Corinthian church. Because the problem with the first Corinthian church was there were a whole lot of know-it-alls there. A whole lot of educated people in the, in the Corinthian church. You know, a whole lot of folks that, that so a lot of us think all this stuff we go through in the body of Christ is something new. It's not. There's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. You know, what's been done today has been done by somebody before. Okay? Everybody tries to do it their way until they realize that God's way is better. Amen? And that's just what it's about. Why do we do sunrise service? Not because I came up with that. It's not because I came up with that. That wasn't my idea. It was a it's Bible. All four gospels. <clears throat> Talk about the women getting up what? Early in the morning. To do what? To go to the tomb. For what? They weren't sure. As far as they were concerned, they were trying to figure out who's going to roll the stone away so we can prepare our Lord's body for burial. So we can properly anoint him and, and put the aloes around him and do all these kinds of things. They still seen a Savior who was in the grave. But yet, they went to that tomb. And when they got there, what had happened was unexpected. The stone was rolled away. They couldn't do it, okay? It took a number of men to do it. But when they got there, they found his body not there. Now what do we do? Oh, for us today, that's victory. For them, they were perplexed. But Jesus didn't let up there, did he? He met him on the way. He met him on the, Emmaus, the road to Emmaus. He went into the room where the disciples were up there and showed himself. And some of the statements he made to those guys was what? Like Doubting Thomas. We always remember the story of Doubting Thomas, right? What did he say? What did he tell the disciples? Now here, all the disciples, now everybody in this church, if everybody in this body came to you, angel, you were here, Jesus came in the room, showed himself, revealed himself to all of us, now, angel wasn't here. Now, everybody here says, we've seen the Lord. We're excited. Man, he, he did rise. He rose from the dead just like he said he would. Told him four times before he got crucified he was going to come back. They didn't get it. Now, here's the angel. The angel said, right. I don't care. Because I remember what Pastor Randy said. Just because the majority says it's so doesn't make it so. You know, you've heard me preach that, right? Just because, you know, if the majority votes A, Y, or whatever, that, that's how it's Not necessarily. But in this case, they could be right. But angels like this, right? So I'll tell you what, when I see him, when I put my finger in the nail holes of his hands, when I can put my hand into his side, then I'm going to believe. Well, you know, Jesus doesn't disappoint. He came back. When I hear his angel, angel says, okay, I believe. And Jesus said, no, that's not good enough. Here, put your fingers here. Put your hand here. He said, seeing, you believe. But more blessed are those who don't see and believe. 
That's what our faith is built on. Amen? Because he vanished from them. He was gone. He got taken up. So, if their faith was not solid, was not put in place, was not preached about, was not told about, was not revealed to them, they would have nothing to hope for. Now, when Jesus rose up, the Bible says in a couple verses, they went away celebrating. They went away happy. They went away excited. In one verse, one of the Gospels, they went into the temple daily praising God. Amen? Who was in the temple? Their enemies. But it didn't matter anymore because they knew they had victory over that. What can man do to me? That's exciting stuff. That's what the body of Christ needs to do today. We have been delivered from death to life through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Paul had a church that we full of smart people. Now in the first verses, first uh, 11 verses of chapter 15, okay, he shares with them that Jesus rose from the dead. How do we know? Because he was seen by Cephas, the disciples, 500 witnesses. And then Paul said, even me, who was born out of due time. Not sure why he was picked, but he wasn't there. But Jesus selected him on the road to Damascus when he was persecuting the church. Taught them these things. But listen to some of the response, starting at verse 12, chapter 15. Verse 12, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can, you some, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection from the dead? But if there's no resurrection from the dead, then how, then, then pardon me, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and our faith is in vain. You know what Paul's saying there to him? If this did not take place, okay, if you believe that Christ was raised, but no one else is raised, then I'm wasting my time. You see what I'm saying? And that's what Paul was telling these folks. If it's not so, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead to raise you up with him, to, 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 to reign in glory with him, then we're wasting our time. I need to give my paycheck back to you guys. Okay? Because you guys, if you guys know me, it's not about paycheck. It's about what Jesus did for me in my life. It's about today. If I didn't get paid a penny, I'm going to stand up here and preach Jesus Christ to you. Bottom line. Some of you know me, some of you don't know me. It's never been about a paycheck to me because I was called of God. The Bible promised me provision would be made for my life if I preached the gospel. So the point of it is, when a man of God is up here preaching to the word, preaching the word of God to you, okay, in the light of this, that means he has to be faithful. That means if I'm preaching, I believe what I'm saying. And if someone doubts, then I'm going to love them through that. And I'm going to excite them through that. Because if they stay around me long enough, they're going to know that I'm dingy enough that they're going to ask me, why are you acting like this? See, it's all right to be a fool for Jesus. Okay, nothing wrong with that. See, we get inhibited because we think, if I clap my hands, if I praise, praise God, they're going to think I'm somebody. They need to think you're somebody. They need to see you clapping your hands. They need to see you praising God. Okay? They need to see you being a Christian. They need to see you being Christ-like. That's what they're looking for. That's what they're looking for. And if Christ has not been raised and our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are found, okay, and it said we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if the dead are not raised. I know it's hard to understand. But you're telling people one thing, okay, and they're believing in another thing. And he's saying, if we're proclaiming that God did indeed do this, but yet it didn't happen, what's the sense? Why do we come to church on Sunday? Now again, some of us are here because it's Easter Sunday. See, to me, it's Easter Sunday every Sunday. Because if not for Christ dying on the cross and rising again on the third day, I would not be here. You would not be here. Do we ever look at that in the light of that? If you look at that in the light of that, how that is said, you would be excited. Man, I'm going to be there. 
I'm going to be there. Because you know what? Because I know that I know that I know God's going to do something. And I don't want to miss it. When's the last time you ever felt about that, that way about church? I don't want to miss it. I don't care if I don't go to work, but I'm not going to miss church. Most of you do just the opposite. I don't care if I miss church, but I'm going to go to work. If I don't go to work, I'm going to stop. But if you have faith in the Word of God, what's the Word of God say? Don't worry about those things. God knows what you have need of. He's going to provide your needs. If our faith grows in Christ and what He did, and we believe in that, we're taken care of. Now, I'm not saying this word. That's not what I'm saying. See, I had to work one day a week. I got the best job in the world. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't going to mention anybody's name. But some people think that pastors work. Well, no, I'm just saying. I'm, just I'm, I'm teasing Chris. They, they, they tease me and say, well, we know you guys work one day a week. And I'm like, yeah, but man, it's the greatest one day I, I get to have. <laughs> Amen? It's like I told you before, today's my day off. I got all day. So I can preach good, bad, and different. Don't make any difference to me. It's what you guys do with that. See, some of you guys are going to sit there and say, oh, it's 1 o'clock. Do I dare be the first one to get up? That's what you start thinking, isn't it? Man, i got to get out of here. You're still preaching. But if I get up and leave, what are people going to think? Don't matter, does it? Sometimes you got to get up and go. See, we worry less about sometimes what people think about us. What we should worry about is not what they think about why we're leaving, but who they, what they think about us and our relationship with Christ. Sometimes we get get up worried about everything else, and we forget the purpose that we're here. This is a gift, okay? We've been given the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a great gift, okay? That's a great gift. Eternal life our Lord to be worshiping at the throne room of God with Christ because of what he did. There's no other way there either. Jesus made the way by the cross. That's exciting stuff. You want to have church? You've got to have church. You're not going to have church here if you don't have church here. Okay? This is where it takes place. You got saved. The Holy Spirit dwells in this temple. You're the temple of the living God. This is where church takes place. People think I do this when I came up here on Sunday. Because sometimes what I do is I practice during the week. Because I got all the time to work. So I practice. Okay, Lord, what is it you'd have me do today? You want me, let me ask you, do I act stupid? Or do I act serious? Or do I do this? Or do I do that? And God always says, don't do this. This is what I want you to do. Why? Because he says, I want you to learn it first. Because if you don't learn it first, and you don't apply it in your life first, then they're not going to get it out here. See, if I don't believe in the resurrection, I'm not excited about the resurrection. It's going to be hard for you to get excited about the resurrection. It does start up here. Okay? But it doesn't stop up here. The idea of it is we stop it here. We have to carry it there. And that's what Paul was saying. He said, if we preach Christ is, is risen from the dead, and then God lifted him up, and it didn't so happen, then we wasted our time. But Paul never wasted his time. Okay, his goal was what? To see people saved. To see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because why? Because of what Jesus did in his life. Anyone knows anything about Paul? What kind of man was he? He was a religious man. we got religious people in church all day long. Are they saved? Not necessarily. Religious doesn't mean you're saved. Paul was a religious man. He was a very smart man. He knew all the rules and regulations, the do's and don'ts of God. Okay? And he lived them better than most anybody in his time. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Now once Jesus was dead, buried, rose again, the church started to blossom. Why? Because people got excited. Why? Because a new teaching had taken place. Not taken away from the old, but Jesus added to those things. You can't just say it, you've got to do it. And when Jesus told that to the Pharisees, boy, that just blew their whole teaching right out of the water. Because they were a do as I say, not as I do kind of people. That's not the kind of pastor you want. It's not the kind of preacher you want. You want somebody that lives what they say they believe. And you want to see that they live what they believe. Amen? And you should be entitled to that. We've already seen all the other crap out there. People are looking for truth. People are looking for genuineness. They're looking for real people that love the Lord. Paul was this kind of guy. Now, I want to tell you something. Paul was persecuting the church. Okay? He was like a lot of people nowadays. 
They, they look down the nose at the church, they point their finger at the church, and most of them don't even know what the church is really about. It's always amazing to me that when you take a stand on something and stand on the word of God, that's when people all of a sudden they become all knowing of the Bible. Now, there's two things you can do. You can try to convince them by showing them how much more Bible you know than them. Or you can love them through it by showing them that you live what the Word of God tells you to do. That's the difference. People are not seeing that today. Paul, on his way to the church of Damascus with letters from the other religious leaders, wanted to do what? He wanted to shut the cause of Christ down. He didn't want it taught, didn't want it preached, didn't want to talk about it. But on his way there, God had another plan. He drove him down to the ground, blinded him, and grabbed hold of his life. Now, think about this guy. This was a guy that was persecuting the church, putting people in prison, consenting to death of anybody who talked about Christ. He stood at the stone of Stephen, held their coats. That's a kind of guy. Now, that's the kind of religious guy you want to run up. Okay, today we're going to stone Jimmy. So... Just so you know, I'm with you on this thing. I want to hold you. I want to make it easy for you. I don't want you anything in your hands so you can really sling that stone. Don't want you to miss. I want you to be able to aim. So let me take care of this. That's the kind of guy Paul was. Let me help you condemn this guy to shut him up. What Paul didn't realize when Stephen died, the gospel got proclaimed even more. People got scattered, but they, did, they didn't stop preaching about Jesus. They preached about it even more. But God had a plan for Paul. He drove him down in the road and grabbed his life and changed him. Sent him to Annas. And he said, speak to him, teach him, train him, raise him up, because he is going to be my disciple. And I'm going to show him the many things he must suffer for me. Now, when you read what Paul wrote and stuff like that, his suffering, he gloried in it. I'm suffering for my Savior. I'm suffering for my Lord. I can't go through anything so bad that it's as bad as what he went through for me. That's love. And why wouldn't somebody listen to somebody like that? He was the worst of the worst. He got saved, man. When he got changed, he just started preaching the gospel. He didn't show his credentials out there. He just said, I'm saved. I'm washing the blood of Jesus. Jesus rose for me and set me free. I want you to have the same gift I have. That's what the resurrection means. Okay? People have asked me, how come you don't change your thinking? How come you don't do things different? I said, well, let me share something with you. I got saved a little over 30 years ago. Okay? That's no big deal. There's been people saved 50 or 60. That's why I'm saying that. And I've been here. I've been here. I've been here. I've been here. We've had food. We haven't had food. We had money for rent. We didn't have money for rent. We fretted. We worried. We did all those kind of things. Not one time did my Lord let me down. Not one time. Not one time. We had to give a brand new car back. Had to give it back. It was the most humbling but greatest moment of my life. Because I was a real material guy. That's my wife. We were just talking about this the other day. I had to have a new car every year. I tried to blame it on her. You know, you know how girls are with the Joneses? It's not the guys, really, is it? And, it, and then our wives that drive us to do those things, Rick. Go with me on this. Don't be looking over at country. Look at Rick goes, how close are Sherry? I used to blame my wife for these things. What we do, we used to get fights because she wouldn't let me get those things that I always wanted all the time because we really couldn't afford them. But I didn't believe that because I was working for it. I deserved those things. And when I got saved, Jesus changed those things. All of a sudden, I realized that things weren't as important as what my life had gained. Because I got my family back. I got my children back. I started getting friends. Imagine that. Friends. People that actually liked me. I didn't know how to do I, didn't, I know better. Yeah, let's try. It's kind of hard now, too, isn't it? It's like, I got friends who are kind of like, man, we've known that guy for a while. I'm still not sure. But they still hang around, though. Oh, better go. Yeah, there. All these things. Our rent got paid. Our refrigerator got. We came home from church one night. Our porch was filled with food. I don't know how I got there. All I know is when I went to church, we had nothing in our home. Nothing. But somebody seen something and did exactly what God told them to do. That's why I stay like I stay like I stay. 
because he's never let me down. Have I been that perfect for him always? No. But I still can't imagine a life outside of Christ. Can't imagine it. I don't care how bad it gets. Don't care how bad it gets. And it could get worse. We were kind of scared with my granddaughter, with the sick and the wells. We've just had other things happen. It could get worse. But Jesus never changes. That's what this is about. We've got to remain faithful. This is the foundation of our faith. If this is not what we believe, then we're wasting our time. If this is as good as it gets, the Word of God says, if this is as good as it gets, and it says that we are all men to be most pitied. And that's sad. And some of us think that. Some of us have been in church all of our lives. Some of us have been in church for a long time. Yet some of us still believe that this is it. And that's why some of us never experience the full grace of God. The full dwelling of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Because we limit what God can do with us. And that's not what God wants us in the body of Christ. Because guess what? Whether you believe or not, doesn't matter. He's risen. Not only does the word of God say so, but even people who didn't even believe in Jesus. Anybody ever heard of Josephus? Okay, we got one person. Josephus, two people, three people. He was a Jewish historian, a Pharisee. Okay? They said he was very dot the I's, cross the T's kind of guy. I was reading the book the other day, Josephus, three times he says in that thing that he referred to Jesus as a man. He said, but yet, I'm not sure that's what he was. Now here's a guy that didn't believe, didn't know, but yet knew something different about Christ. When people try to refute the word of God, you can even go to a non-believer's book, which a lot of historians use, and he proves the fact that Christ did what he said he did. He was crucified. Historical. Okay? Some people say, well, you know, you believe in that Bible and those, those tales and all those men wrote that thing. How do you believe that thing? Because it's backed up by history. Go to the art museums. What, what paintings do you see more of, or illustrations more of, than the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or his birth at Christmas time? Jesus is the most talked about controversial individual in history. But Josephus, what brings him, what makes Josephus more solid is he was a Jewish Pharisee who didn't believe in Jesus, but yet said Jesus did what he said he did. That's what excites me. When you go to a book and a guy that doesn't even believe says, he did it. He did it. It's right here. You can believe your Bible because I'm a lost guy and I was there. And when you read Josephus, you've got to read really slow. Because even as smart as I am, I know you guys think I'm really intelligent and stuff like that. But I read through Josephus. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty tough reading. You've got to go really slow. But the thing that impressed me was how many times when he said, the man Jesus, yet I would not refer to him as a man. And I'm thinking, wow, wonder why he didn't get saved. Here was a guy that lived it, seen it happen, confirmed it in his writings. And yet... Didn't grasp it. Didn't get a hold of it. Didn't change his life. But guess what? He gave us the information to back up this word. Okay? With eyewitness accounts. That even lost people said he did what he said he came to do. He did die on the cross. He was beaten horrifically. He was beat horribly. And he hung on that cross. And he died. And he was buried. And he rose again. Okay, here's a historian. No other leader in history has that ever been written about, has the claims ever been made, that their tomb is empty. Don't make no difference who they are. They're here. Jesus is the only one from the historians, and the word of God says he is no longer there. He did what he said he came to do. Who did he do it for? Not for attention, not for promotion, not for position. He did it for us. Every one of us. And I always like the illustration. And I'm closing with this. I've heard people say this many, many times. And, and I don't think about it a lot. Uh, because, you know, you just want to see people eat. But people say, you know something? 
if Rebecca was the only person on this earth, Jesus died for her. Didn't it make you special? Didn't it make you precious? If we just thought about that, that if we went home and looked in the mirror and just really believed and said, you mean if I was it? If I was all there was? Jesus still would love me that much? God would have loved me that much to send his son to die for me? Absolutely. Because sin had separated you from God. Jesus' death reconciled you to God. Because he took your place. That's how special you are. He took your place. How many people have ever said they would do that for you? You deserve what you get, but guess what? I don't want you to get it. I'm going to take it for you. I'm going to serve your time. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do all these things for you. Why? Because I love you. Man, what better example of love? And Jesus said that. No greater love is this than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for this time. Father, it's all about you. Father, I just pray that always, 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 that we as a church, that we as a body, that we genuinely, that we be real. And Father, that people would see Jesus in us. Father, that Jesus said that, that we would use your whole counsel, your whole word. Father, there, there, there's more there that we need to read and need to learn and grow. And Father, the most critical thing, though, is if anyone today in this place died without you as Lord and Savior, then they're going to a place of eternity that they're not going to want to go. We don't talk about sin. We don't talk about hell enough. And Father, you created hell for the devil and his demons. But you also created hell for those people that choose to reject you and turn their lives away from you. So Father, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. And Father, we as Christians need to step up and be real. We as Christians need to step up and be genuine. We as Christians need to live out our lives as Christ gave them to us, new, refreshed, different, not better. We're not better than anybody. We're sinners saved by grace. That's the only difference. Sinners saved by grace. Every one of us sinned and separated us from God. Jesus came to take that sin on the cross for us, that we could be reconciled, that we could become the righteousness of God. Speak the hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.